Coming up, we're going to take a look at how you can run your even most demanding workloads on Azure and future-proof your apps with near limitless growth capacity using Azure SQL Database Hyperscale. Now we're going to show you how you can easily update your existing databases to hyperscale without re-architecting your apps, and we'll demonstrate major advantages from super fast data backup and restore times, and the flexibility that comes from independently and fluidly scaling compute and data replicas. So today I'm joined by a well-known industry expert, Kevin Farley from the database engineering team in Azure. Welcome. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you on. This is a really popular topic, Azure SQL Database Hyperscale. Can we talk about what it is and what we're solving for here? Sure. It's a cloud-native performance tier of Azure SQL Database. So it's highly scalable in the storage aspect. You'll find that there's not even a max database size in the portal when you go to configure it. Right. You can scale your compute. It's got elastic compute. You can scale up and down very simply. It's a fully managed service as with the other Azure SQL database offerings. It uses the same engine as SQL Server. So the behavior is going to be very familiar. It's exactly what you're used to with Azure SQL database or even SQL Server on premise. You don't have to learn anything new to use it. Exactly. There's no new syntax. You use your existing tool set. You don't have to learn new tools for mm -hmm. this but you still take advantage of the built-in intelligence and security capabilities that come with the Azure platform. So you get the best of both worlds there. We have a few major differences from the other offerings, though, that come with very large scale. So with very large database operations, we remove a lot of the common pain points around performance and storage limitations. With hyperscale, the time to resize compute is independent of the size of data. We support up to 100 terabytes of storage today, but of course, that'll expand further over time. Backups are near instantaneous, and you can do data restores in minutes rather than days or even weeks. This is a big deal. To put this into perspective, uh, that amount of storage capacity is really orders of magnitudes much larger than most PaaS databases out there. So you're not going to have to provision any more storage. That's another component, effectively, that's broken away from the compute layer and the logging layer. And you don't have to worry about things like performance degradation, which is common when you're running ongoing operations on these really huge data sets over time. So all that pain goes away. It does. So how, how is this actually built, and what's behind it? What's the architecture of this then look like? So unlike traditional databases, Hyperscale decouples the storage from the compute and the log engines. These components work and scale independent, and then they work together. The storage engine, as always, persists all your data. This case is built on a microservices architecture that can scale out horizontally as needed. It consists of page servers. Each page server manages 128 gigabytes worth of data pages, and each page server has a secondary for resiliency. When your application requires even more storage, we just add more page servers to the configuration, all the way up to 100 terabytes or more someday. So this architecture then help in terms of querying speed as well and performance against these huge data sets? Yes, it does. In fact, let's start with the read operations. We have a multi-tiered architecture with caching at each tier so the data engine can go fast. The computes have their own SSD-based caching that scales with the number of cores you configure for your compute layers. And that way, we get access to the hot data set very quickly. And to speed up querying performance, each page server has SSD cache for the entire range of data that it manages. So a 128 gigabyte page server is going to have 128 gigabytes of local SSD with all of its data cached. So when a query comes in, the compute engine will first look in its own cache to see if it's got the data right there locally. If so, that's going to take about half a millisecond to retrieve it extremely fast. Right, that's the fastest kind of layer where I can look at for it in the cache. Right. If it doesn't find what it needs in its local cache, it's going to make a request to the page server that manages the pages that it needs. And that whole trip is going to take about two milliseconds. So we're seeing then basically at the top layer is it's really, really fast cache. And as it gets slower and lower into this Azure store, it's getting a bit slower. But it's always going to try to get the local cache when it can to avoid having to go down into the Azure storage layer. Right. You get in your cache from where you need it, when you need it. All right, so that's read operations, super fast, half a millisecond to two milliseconds. But what about write operations? What happens there? To speed up write operations, this is where the log server really comes in. The log server is now the source of truth. It maintains a record of all updates. When a write operation needs to be performed to complete a transaction, the compute engine is going to write the log update into a very fast region of premium storage we call the landing zone. At that point, the transaction is complete. 
Now the log engine retrieves the updates from the landing zone, which is a small set of very fast storage, and routes the updates to the page server so that they can update their copy of the data. Mm -hmm. And it will also send it to the secondary replicas that may have that page cached. Finally, it takes those updates and persists them in the long-term log storage, which is a much larger region of Azure standard storage. And we actually keep the log data online in that long-term storage for as long as your backup retention window lasts. So instead of doing log backups, we just keep the log online for the entire time, which makes the restores very fast because you don't have to do a separate data restore and log restore. Okay, so we've talked about reads and writes. What do we actually need to do in terms of scaling out our compute? So there's two dimensions to scaling. You can add more cores to scale up. And because we've separated out the compute from the storage, you can scale the compute more rapidly. We just add a new secondary compute with the new number of cores, whether that's greater or lesser number of cores, mm -hmm. into the configuration. And when that new set of compute is up and stable, we just do a failover to it. So right, it's, going so it's to, really fast. It takes a couple minutes to stand up the new compute, mm -hmm. and then the actual disruption is near instantaneous for just that failover. Yeah, when you contrast that to having to move from, say, rack one to rack two of a more powerful machine, you're saving hours or days of time. Exactly. And you don't have to move the data to do it. So the other dimension, of course, is scaling out. We have the ability to have multiple replicas. You have the primary, which handles the read-write traffic, and you have up to four secondary replicas, which handle read-only traffic. So now you can scale out your read access to the secondary compute replicas. So for large reporting workloads, for seasonal querying or seasonal reporting needs where there's a lot of read access, you can route all that traffic to the set of secondary replica nodes and steady state traffic can still be routed to the primary compute. And the interesting thing about the way we've, again, separated the compute from the storage is that all of these compute replicas share the same set of page servers. You're not having to make copies and duplicating your data in order to have multiple compute replicas. So now you can see the full picture. You can see the full architecture and how it comes together. You've got the compute engines with the primary and the compute replicas, the primary sending the updates into the log landing zone, the log server, then forwarding those updates to the page servers and to the secondary compute. And finally, the page servers persisting the data in Azure standard storage. So really here, the separation between the compute, the log services, the paging servers, and also the replicas is really key to hyperscale. But I can see how this would be useful from the large data operations perspective and also doing online transaction processing, maybe something that's very analytics intensive or read intensive, like the Black Fridays or tax seasons that we might see for these seasonal spikes. But let's say we want to convert an existing smaller Azure SQL database to hyperscale. How would we do that? So here I'm in the Azure portal. We have an existing database called AdventureWorks. It's in the basic performance tier, general purpose. So we're looking at the database now. We see that it's in the general purpose performance tier over here. So we just go to the configure blade, which is where we will change the configuration of this database. You'll see up here we have the general purpose, hyperscale, and business critical performance tiers as options, we just check hyperscale tier. Similar to the provisioning screen we saw earlier. It's exactly the same screen. So you choose your generation of hardware, the number of cores, the number of replicas, and again, there's no max database size here. So I dropped it down to zero secondary replicas. Of course, you've always got the primary. And just hit go. And at that point, we're moving the database into hyperscale. So we're taking the Azure storage that the general purpose databases use for storage converting that into the, the storage under the page servers. So not separated. Right. And now you're doing, standing up the rest of the hyperscale pieces and so it's kind it of So it's kind of splitting my other PaaS servers into the components of hyperscale, so you've got everything separated as, as separate services. Exactly. So you can also automate the addition of replicas or scaling of cores, for that matter, to plan for peak time. So if you have predictable peaks in your usage patterns, you can set up scripts in advance that automatically scale up in advance of your peak usage and then scale back down when the peak is done. Right, so now once we're in Azure, what other things can we start to light up now that we're hyperscale? One of the big advantages of hyperscale is the time to restore. Mm -hmm. Data restorations can be done in a matter of minutes. Here I have a 50 terabyte database. This is 50 terabytes of actual data in here. It's not just an empty 50 terabyte container. Mm -hmm. So we'll hit restore. We're going to give it a unique name so it gets restored on the side. It's not restoring over an existing database. Makes sense. I select the point in time that we want it to restore to. 
choose the hardware spec that we want to restore to and go down and hit accept and we will go. So now that the restore is happening, I'm starting a timer over here so we'll know exactly how long it took. There's an activity monitor here that will show when the database restore is actually complete. So we'll know that it's done at that point. So what's going on in the background, we have three page servers and this is a timeline for the page servers. Mm -hmm. Each page server is periodically taking snapshots of the Azure storage underneath it. And you'll note that those snapshots don't have to be synchronized. They're so we're not having to get a big mm -hmm. sync point and install everything. Okay. So we have a collection of snapshots over time. And of course, we've got the log landing zone and long-term storage with the log service over here. Right. Backup has no impact on your running application because it's metadata and it's fully buffered by the cache in the page servers. Mm -hmm. So we've decided our point in time that we want to take the database to right before somebody hit delete table. We choose the set of snapshots immediately before that point in time. And we also find the point in the log stream that corresponds to the start of the oldest transaction active at the time we took the first snapshot. So that way you can get all the gaps maybe that you're missing from when those snapshots are taken. Exactly. So we can roll it forward to a consistent point mm -hmm. in time and roll it forward to the point that we want to be at when we're right. finished doing the restore. And we have the point in time. Now that gives us the range of log data that we're going to need to accomplish this restore. Okay. So now we create the Azure storage components. We create the Azure storage for the data files and the long-term storage container for the log. We'll copy the log from the database we're storing into the new database. Mm -hmm. This is a metadata-only operation, and all those data elements get copied in parallel. So with, with our big database, we might be copying hundreds of page servers worth of data. This makes for a simpler picture. Okay. So we've got the long-term storage primed with the data as well as the page servers. So we're standing up the page servers, attaching them to their data blobs, and attach the log service with its log landing zone. The page servers start filling their cache from the Azure storage, and the log service pulls the data from the long-term storage and fills its log landing zone cache. Now we create the primary compute to work on this. It will start running recovery. Log service then pulls the updates out of the log landing zone and updates the pages in the page server and use accelerated database recovery to finally bring the database online. So now we've got all the different services stood up, everything's wired back together, and now we can go back to that restoration point. Exactly. So we've snipped a little bit of time out of the restore process just to avoid some dead air here. So we're 14 minutes into the restore. Again, this is a 50 terabyte database. So the first thing you'll see is in the list of Databases in the bottom, the restore database just popped up there. Mm -hmm. So the database is in existence. It's been put together. We're just finishing running recovery on the database here. And that will take a few more seconds to complete. So a lot of the time is just spent building out those page servers, right? Exactly. We've got 800 page servers, each 128 gigabytes, and we've got 50 terabytes. Right. So it is a pretty massive database <laughs> at exactly. the end of the day. Yeah. We can see the database restore is still in progress while it's just finishing up the last bits of the recovery and roll forward. And in just a couple seconds, it's complete. So now we've restored a 50 terabyte database in 14 minutes and 58 seconds, which is just astounding. So this is massive. Just the physics of moving that data around before would have taken days or weeks to be able to restore that size of data. You did that in just about 14 minutes. So what's the experience like, though, if we switch gears to scaling out? So what I have here is a benchmark driver. This is what we use for driving benchmark testing. Mm -hmm. I have two configurations here. One configuration is sends the transactions all to the primary. So all the data is going to the primary node, and the other labeled scale out is sending data to both the primary and the read replicas. Okay, so the primary is just one replica. Exactly. Yep. So we started the transactions going all to the primary. It's the same workload, just whether it gets sent to two places or not. Mm -hmm. So you'll see the transactions per second on the right, and this is a chart showing the same thing. And it will jump around when we first start as all those threads get themselves running and stable. It's going to stabilize at about 23, 25 transactions per second here. Right. So, so it's starting to settle in. It's starting to normalize. And we can start looking at different kind of polling times. And now we're seeing a very normalized and smooth curve of our transaction times per second and also our, our reads. Right. So this is the baseline. This is what it takes to drive this workload, which is very CPU heavy, funneling all of the traffic through the primary replica. Mm -hmm. So it's taking 100% of the workload and the, the secondaries are just sitting idle at this point. 
Okay, and there we can see again our, our kind of steady state is anywhere between about 22 and 30 or so transactions per second. So still still not uh, not a slouch in terms of speed, right. but we can do better with this, right? If we decide we want to go to that scale out scenario from just the primary. Exactly. So here we're going to come down, we're going to pause the threads that are running the primary only workload and mm -hmm. start up the threads that are running the scale up workload. Okay. And the only difference is the connection string that does the routing. Got so it. you see that hockey stick when that curve jumps way up. Yep. So we're 23 to 25 transactions per second. And as this then again settles in, because it's a new set of threads, it's going to settle in right around 70, 65 to 70 transactions per second. Mm -hmm. So there's a significant difference in throughput here. We've taken an application that was tapped out at 23, 25 transactions right. per second, and we've about tripled the throughput here. This is awesome because you just had to flip one switch effectively. Now you can start routing more transactions. Those are the replicas. And you've got a throughput that's effectively triple of what you had before. Exactly. So we've shown now how you can convert existing PaaS database workloads then to use hyperscale. But I bet a lot of the folks that are watching right now are thinking, I've got SQL databases that are sitting on-prem, and I want to move into hyperscale, maybe retire a data mart that's on-premises. How would I do that? Right. Not just data marts. People are interested in using hyperscale to consolidate all of their databases. So if they've got a bunch of smaller databases, that had to be separate because of the capacity they had access to at the time, mm -hmm. now they can consolidate those all into a single database with hyperscale. And because it's pass, we do the managing for you. It's fewer databases to manage, and we do a lot of that work for you. To migrate your on-premises large database, there's a few standard options. You can ingest the data directly from your on-premise applications into the hyperscale database. Over the wire. Over the wire. That works just fine, but if you've got terabytes of data, you may want to use something like the Azure Import Export Service. And that's where you copy your data onto hard drives locally, and they're encrypted and conditioned, shipped up to the Azure Data Center, and we can copy the data off there. It ends up being right. much faster. Again, we're talking about terabytes of data, so the physical shipment of the hard drive in lots of cases will be faster. Exactly. We're working on additional tools for migration, and of course, you can also tap into our partner ecosystem for additional help. Really great to see all of this working in, in hyperscale and all the massive things that we can do here. For people that are watching at home, where can they go to learn more? So you can visit aka.ms slash sqldb underscore hyperscale to learn more. Thanks, Kevin. And don't forget to subscribe to Microsoft Mechanics and keep watching for the latest tech updates across Microsoft. That's all the time we have for today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.